It's been a crazy week here at Starbase, which you would know already if you've seen this week's Starbase update, but a lot of developments are difficult to see from the ground. So we need a new angle, the sky. In this special flyover edition of Starbase Update, Sean and I went to 10,000 feet to get a new perspective on things here in Starbase. So let's talk about what we saw. A very late breaking news development here at Starbase occurred on Sunday with the rollout of the hot staging test article to the Massey test site. We had to add this in in a rush on the latest Starbase update video as activity is always ongoing in Boca Chica. We previously explained that this hot stage test article is made out of a booster forward dome section, the actual hot staging ring itself, and a single ring in place of the lowest part of the ship. During our flyover, we were able to spot the whole setup already being prepared to be lifted on the structural test stand. The booster forward dome was lifted onto the stand a few hours after, but the hot staging ring was disconnected and reconnected a few times. Now we don't know why this happened, but it might have just been for a few minor checkouts and necessary adjustments before testing. As of the writing of this script, teams have already lifted the ship aft section ring on top of the hot staging ring and installed the structural test stand cap on top of the whole deal. Fun fact, they did all of this as we were writing the script. You should have seen us changing this part like three times in the span of a few hours. But that's just how SpaceX works. Let us know in the comments if the ropes on the structural test stand cap have already been installed by the time you watch this. In fact, I, I bet they've been installed. I, I don't know. Why, why does SpaceX have to move so fast? Just kidding. I love it. Anyway, this ring will have to endure lots of different loads during flight, but perhaps the most important one will be the crushing forces of the fully fueled ship being pressed against this ring at three or four Gs of acceleration near the end of the booster's burn. We've gotten some comments saying, actually, max Q is the most strenuous part of flight because it's touted as the part where there are the most aerodynamic forces exerted on the vehicle. But you have to remember where this ring is located. This is not located at the front of the vehicle where all of those aerodynamic forces are acting upon the rocket. It's in the middle of the stack. Here, the weight of the ship on top and the thrust of the engines at the bottom are pushing on this ring as the rocket heads uphill into space. On the ascent, many other loads will be applied, such as torsion and bending loads, as the rocket pitches down and has to endure different wind conditions. To this ring, those aerodynamic forces at max Q will just add up to the force from the mass of the fully fueled ship on top. It will be as if the ship is a little bit heavier since the air will be pushing on the ship and the ship will be pushed on the ring. This aerodynamic force quickly disappears as the vehicle climbs into thinner and thinner atmosphere. And as acceleration builds up near stage separation, the force of the fully fueled ship against the ring will greatly surpass that. These forces near stage sep are something to take into account, not just on Starship, but also on other rockets. This is normally compensated for by throttling down and limiting the acceleration, normally to three or four Gs, depending on the rocket. A similar thing happens at max Q, but this is to limit the forces exerted on the top of the vehicle due to aerodynamics. Something tells me we should do a video about max Q at some point and all of the implications of this phase of flight. In any case, the structural test stand is capable of exerting all kinds of forces on the test article, so whatever phase of flight you're most concerned about, it'll be tested thoroughly. Don't worry. Flying over from Massey's to Starbase, the first thing you encounter is the propellant production site, also known as the Sanchez site. Right at the edge of this location is the ground fabrication building, which had been relocated from the production site to here. You can see that work on this building now covers almost the entirety of its footprint. Also here at the Sanchez site is the last section of the new mega bay. On this week's Starbase update, I mentioned that there was two pieces remaining, but since the recording and editing of that video, one of them had been rolled over to the production site and prepared to be lifted onto the structure. Moving north from the Sanchez site is the rocket garden, where old and new vehicles alike sit in purgatory and await their fate. Of the three boosters displayed here, the ones on the sides are booster four and booster 11, while the center one is booster 10. Pro tip, if you're trying to discern which booster is which, the one that looks kind of gold and slightly rusted is booster four, as it's been sitting out there for quite a while. Another way you can ID booster four specifically is it's the one with the coquettishly tilted grid fin. Booster 10 was recently moved here just a few weeks ago after completing cryo-proof testing at Massey's. You can see the teams have set up tents around the base of Booster 10, perhaps to work on its engine section and even receive engines here. We thought this work would occur in the Mega Bay, but perhaps SpaceX has other thoughts in mind and prefers to keep the space free inside that building for future vehicles. As always, we'll have to wait and see exactly what happens, so stay tuned. 
Next to these boosters are the remains of Ship 27 and SN15. We can see that while Ship 27's common dome section is all bent and out of shape, SN15's common dome section is still in one piece. Some had speculated that SN15 was scrapped due to it having a crumpled common dome like Ship 27, but as you can see, that's not the case. It seems like SN15 was merely added to the list of house cleaning items when SpaceX went to clear up the rocket garden. And I'm still mad that Ship 20 and Booster 4 have not yet been scrapped. <laughs> Moving over to the production site, we can get a glimpse inside the high bay with work on Ship 30's forward dome section as it awaits stacking inside. This stacking happened just a few hours after we flew and we captured it via our Starbase live cameras. Inside of the mega bay, we can see a mobile crane at the entrance. Over the last week or so, we've seen a bunch of lifts working inside the mega bay, but we haven't seen any stacking work on any vehicle so far. In fact, you can see here Booster 12's methane tank is still waiting to be stacked on the liquid oxygen tank, which is currently on the other side of the building. This kind of crane and lift work on the mega bay makes me think they might be doing some remodeling inside that we just can't properly see from either the ground or the air. You can see right in front of the old mega bay that there is the third section for the fifth level of the new mega bay, as I had alluded to earlier. You can also see the black LR11000 crane still attached to the second stage of that fifth level up at the top of the new mega bay. It'll likely be a few days until the new section on the ground is picked up by that crane and lifted, but you can keep an eye on it on Starbase Live for when that happens. Also at the production site, we have the ring yard where multiple different ring sections and barrels and ship parts and booster parts are all waiting to either be used on test articles or future vehicles. Here we can see, for example, Ship 30 and Ship 31's mid-locks sections. There's also a booster aft section and header tank, which have been covered up by a tarp for some reason. Once again, on this week's Starbase update video, we mentioned that the Ship 24.2 payload bay test article had been moved to the mid-bay. Well, you can see here, it's already stacked on a single ring that's intended to stand in place as the top ring of a forward dome section of a ship. Once fully welded, we expect this test article to roll out to Massey's and get tested at the nose cone structural test stand, which has been modified specifically to test this article. Also in the mid-bay, right next to the Ship 24.2 test article, still resides the former and mysterious Ship 22 nose cone. Woo, spooky. This nose cone has had a lot of work done on it, as we can see from this ground photo I took a few weeks ago. You can see tons of weld marks, indicating that hardware has been installed on its interior. And from these aerial shots, you can even see some sort of entrance to it as well. I can't help but wonder what sort of prototype this nose cone has been repurposed for. I've seen some people speculate that it might be for a human landing system mock-up. Or I've seen some other people say it could be being used for a crewed Starship interior mock-up. Either way, if it's important enough, I'm sure we'll find out about it sooner or later. The sky gives us a great vantage point to see the work being done on the extension to the Star Factory building. This building is not only being expanded to the northeast, but now also to the southeast with these other black beams and columns being installed. You can see that the foundations are being laid to continue this building all the way up to Highway 4. Notice how there's a little patch of land that is not owned by SpaceX and they'll just have to build around. Of course, the main attraction here at Starbase is the launch site, not just from the ground, but also from the air. Flying over Highway 4 and seeing what is basically the end of Texas is really a beautiful sight. The blue water, the launch facility, you can't beat it. As we approach from the west, we can see Ship 25 still standing on suborbital pad B. Here, work is underway to remove it from this stand and move it elsewhere. But where will it move? Who knows? Maybe it won't even go that far and they're just preparing to free up suborbital pad B for static fire testing of Ship 28. If the launch site is the main attraction of Starbase, the orbital launch mount is the star of the show. Lots of work has been done here since the last time we flew a month ago. Rebar Fest 2023 is now complete and the entire area has been covered over with concrete and fondag. Water pipes were installed, water cooled plates were also installed, tons and tons of concrete was poured, and now, finally, there's not a massive crater in the ground anymore. Hopefully this means that the only hole punched on the next flight of Starship is in the air, as the vehicle climbs through the atmosphere, goes supersonic, and heads into space. There's obviously still work to be done to close out all of the piping and shielding on the orbital launch mount and whatnot, but this may not take that long to complete, so no hurry. Both of these retention ponds existed for the first Starship test flight, but now they've been overhauled, upgraded, and have a brand new look. And 
a whole bunch more concrete. The big pond here, closer to the orbital launch mount that has some water in it, as you may have deduced, is for water. This one has seen the biggest upgrade. Before the first flight, there was a pond for water at the launch site, but it was a small one for the water that was left over from the FireX detonation prevention system. But compared to the new pond is like comparing a kiddie pool to an Olympic pool. This new one is much bigger and for a good reason. Now, in addition to the FireX system, SpaceX will be using the water-cooled steel plate system and all of the water that doesn't turn into steam needs to go somewhere. This pond will be where some of that water runs and is collected. It doesn't seem like SpaceX has a way to reclaim the water in the pond just yet, beyond just using massive 18-wheeler pump trucks, but I'm sure they'll find a way to improve this when the time comes. Right next to the water retention pond is the engine chill pond, which seems to be about the same size as it was previously, before the first Starship flight. It's necessary because each engine is connected to breakaway connections on the orbital launch mount that reclaim the liquid oxygen and liquid methane that are used to chill down each Raptor. The liquid methane is returned back to the ground tanks, while the liquid oxygen is collected via pipes on the orbital launch mount and then diverted into this engine chill pond. This is basically all that this pond does. You can even see the pipe that sticks out of the concrete wall. That is where the liquid oxygen is dumped into the pond. The prior engine chill pond was much more rudimentary, with it just being dumped in a muddy hole in the ground, while this one even has stairs. Look at them! Look at these stairs! They can carry so many people! We can sometimes see workers walking up and down these stairs on our various camera views, and it's hilarious, because when they're down in the pond, all you can see is the top of their little hard hats. It seems like it would be fun to go down there, but don't do it when it's full of liquid oxygen. That would be bad for your health. All right, that's it for this flyover. Thanks for watching and let us know what you thought in the comments. And as always, thank you to all of our members for your support. We would not be able to do things like this without you. So thanks for watching and don't forget, be excellent to each other.